God, as we hear your word proclaimed now, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever heard of or used a website that's called Craigslist? Anybody? You can, it's a website where you can post classified ads about all sorts of things. It could be things for sale, things that you're looking for, places to live. You may have used it yourself, looking for a job, looking for somewhere to live. But what I think is so interesting about this website, so interesting about Craigslist, is just the huge variety of advertisements that you can find on this website. You can just find the most interesting things from the most interesting people. So I'd just like to share with you three ads that I found the other day that I thought were just pretty great. So the first advertisement is for a free item that's being given away. Eric, maybe you could just bring up my slides for me. The first is for a free item that's being given away. And the ad runs like this. It says, free sled of death for those who dare. My son built the sled for him and his buddies. You lay down on it feet first and go down paved streets. He and his friends are all injured now. So for those of you who dare, now it is your turn. There you go. And the second advertisement is an item that's for sale. Do you have indoor chickens or ducks? Do you need diapers for your fowl to keep your house clean? We can help. We make custom chicken and duck diapers in a variety of fabric colors and patterns. Prices from $9 to $12 each. That sounds like a steal for a chicken diaper to me. Well, the final ad, the third one, is from a section of Craigslist that's called Missed Connections. And if you meet someone or you see someone, but you didn't get their contact information, you can post in this section in the wild hope that that other person will see it and contact you. So this ad reads, we were strangers in the 27th row on a flight from Seattle. We didn't even exchange hellos. You seemed a little bit queasy and you kept putting your head on the seat in front of you. I had taken too much cold medication and I decided that you needed a back scratch. We both realized what was happening, but it was too late. I scratched your back in an affectionate manner for at least five seconds, but no more than 10. I patted your back awkwardly at the conclusion of my back scratch, and then I pretended to be asleep. If you are reading this, I am sorry. <laughs> so, when I read these ads, I don't know about you, but my first thought is, who are these people? <laughs> like, who posts an ad like that? These people are kind of strange, aren't they? But this story from Luke's Gospel that we're reading today, it sort of all puts it in perspective for me. These people who are posting these ads, these people are us. Jesus, in this story, interacts with four sets of people who are each a little bit different. Each have some quirks about them. Here in Luke, Jesus has these four moments after a key part of Luke's gospel. In the text we just read, verse 51 says that the days of Jesus' life were drawing to an end, so he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus sets out on the road to the cross, and everything that happens after this point in Luke's gospel happens on Jesus' journey to Jerusalem and to his death. So it's while Jesus is set out on this road that he has these four interactions. And again, each of these people is a little bit different. Each has their own thing, you might say. So we'll just run through these four people briefly, just review their situations, and then we'll see what we can learn from them. Well, the first set of characters that Jesus interacts with on this journey are a couple of hotheads. 
Jesus sent out the disciples ahead of him. They refused entry by a Samaritan village. And that probably would not have been so unusual. You probably heard that Samaritans and Jews, they had both ethnic and religious tension, so they just didn't get along very well. But rejection in this Samaritan village leads James and John to ask if they can call down fire from heaven. And you may have a note at the bottom of your page in your Bible that says something like, some manuscripts add, like Elijah did. So do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them like Elijah did? And what James and John are thinking of is an incident that happened in Elijah's life that's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 1. At that time, King Ahaziah sent 50 men to arrest the prophet Elijah, and they found Elijah sitting at the top of a hill. When the soldiers told Elijah, come down from the hill, we're here to arrest you, you're going to go to the king, Elijah answered, if I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you. And then fire fell down from heaven, and it killed 50 men. So James and John experienced this little bit of resistance here. It sounds pretty good to get rid of those people in that Samaritan village. You know, they say, hey, Jesus, wouldn't it be so much easier if we just wiped these folks out? But Jesus rebukes them. He says, don't do that. Don't, don't do it like Elijah did it. That's not what we are about. After dealing with those two, Jesus meets these three other potential disciples on the road. And the first one is very over-eager. He says what sounds like the right thing. I'll follow you wherever you go. But he's too quick to say it, and he hasn't thought it through yet. If he's like a lot of the other overeager people that I know, he's probably a bit overcommitted too. This this is the guy who's always eager to help. He doesn't know how to say no. He's always in 100% to everything. Sort of reminds me of the eagerness that you see in children a lot of times. Have you ever been with a group of children? You just start a sentence with, I need a volunteer too, and every child will raise their hand. They don't don't know what they're volunteering for, but they're just excited. They want to volunteer. They want to help, which is great. But with this over-eager man in Luke, Jesus doesn't refuse his offer, but Jesus does warn him about the nature of the journey. Jesus says, you're volunteering, or are you sure you want to do this? Do you know what you've signed up for? The next character that Jesus meets on the road gets an invitation to follow. Jesus calls him, but this man is struggling under the weight of his responsibility and his commitments. When Jesus invites him to follow, the son asks to bury his father. And the exchange is kind of so brief that it's hard to tell exactly what's happening. We don't know if the father has literally just died and the son wants to see to the burial. Or maybe the son means that the father is getting older, and he has to stay with his father and care for him until he does die. But either way, Jesus' response kind of sounds a little bit harsh. Let the dead bury their own dead. And Jesus probably means that a bit metaphorically, that let the people who are spiritually dead bury those who are physically dead dead. Jesus means that those who stay behind in this man's family, they'll take up the responsibility and they will bury his father. But it's still challenging. Jesus is telling this man that there are lots of things in life that are important. There are lots of things that are worthy of our time. But sometimes we have to set all of those things aside to focus on the one thing that is most important. This man, who has seen the importance of the kingdom of God, he has to put everything else aside for that kingdom. The final character that Jesus meets on the road is another volunteer. He offers himself up 
but he's almost the opposite of the first volunteer we saw. The first one was over-eager, over-committed, maybe hadn't thought through his decision to follow Jesus. But this guy, the last one, he's like a textbook overthinker. And this is one that we can definitely relate to in the church, I think. Because this guy's willing to follow Jesus, but now is just not the right time. Some point later, maybe, we could do that. You ever been on a committee or been in a meeting or something where there was lots of, lots of discussion, plenty of good ideas were raised, a lot of good points were made, but at the end of the meeting, there's still no decision, right? We still just need to think about that a little more. We need to gather some information. Maybe we'll just decide at the next meeting. You know, sometimes in the church, we like to think about things, and that's okay. But sometimes it takes us a while to make a decision. And that's the case with this guy. He says that he will follow, but just not right now. He needs to go set his house in order first. And that's when Jesus tells him that no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The language of putting the hand to the plow and looking back That alludes to another incident in the life of Elijah, which I think Jesus is thinking of. In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah calls a man named Elisha to be his successor. And when Elijah calls him, Elisha is out in his field plowing. He literally has his hand on the plow when Jesus calls him. And when Elisha is called, he makes the same request that this man does in Luke. He said, Elisha says, let me go home first, let me take care of some things, and then I'll follow you. And Elijah lets him do that. So Elisha goes home, says goodbye to his family, puts things in order, and then he follows Elijah. But here in Luke, Jesus says, maybe that's not so wise. If you need to do something, Just do it. Don't look back. Don't second guess yourself. Just do it. We know that James and John continued to follow Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. But you know what's interesting is that we're not told what any of these other three would be disciples did. Did they follow or did they not? The author probably leaves it open-ended on purpose. We're probably supposed to ask ourselves the question, hmm, what would I do if I were them? What would I do if I were them, and what am I going to do about it right now? So what can we do? What can we take from the examples of James and John and these three other unnamed characters? For me, there are sort of three lessons that come out. And the first would be this, that Jesus welcomes all people to join him on the road. Jesus welcomes everyone to join him on this journey to Jerusalem. That can be kind of a tough concept for us to wrap our heads around sometimes. It's tough for me too, at least. You know, if you're a a state fan, maybe, Sure, you're welcome to come and join us here at Forest Hills on this journey that we're on. Carolina fans, Duke fans, who knows? But state fans, you're good. You know, if you're a a doctor, a lawyer, if you work in finance, if you're a respectable stay-at-home mom, sure, you're welcome to join us. But if you make chicken diapers or do something else that's kind of weird, I don't know. Maybe you ought to follow Jesus somewhere else. Take that journey somewhere else than here. And what's even harder than welcoming the people who are just a little bit strange is welcoming the people that we genuinely don't like. Those people that are really hard to get along with. And life would just be so much better if they weren't in it. Those Samaritan-type people who James and John wanted so badly to get rid of. Those people are really hard to welcome. It's true all the time. 
But I think we're especially reminded of it in election years like this one, aren't we? Where our, our politics, you guys know this, it's increasingly polarized. There's not a whole lot of middle ground anymore. You're kind of on one side or the other. So chances are that when you look at the candidates that we have today, the people supporting those candidates, there's probably one of them that you look at and think, gosh, I really do not like that person. Maybe you would even be tempted to say, I really hate that person. Maybe you look at everybody and think, gosh, I hate them all. I don't know. (laughs) But there's probably somebody. Because our political process is increasingly generating those kinds of feelings. Those people that we don't like, who are not on our side, who don't agree with us, they're a threat. They are our enemy. We don't need to welcome those people. We need to beat them. That's what we're told. But that's the opposite of what Jesus does here. Jesus welcomes everyone. Do you have such a short temper? Are you so angry that you want to murder people because they're a little bit rude to you, like James and John? Well, hey, you are welcome. Are you flighty? Are you overeager? Overcommitted, you are welcome. Are you so overwhelmed by the responsibilities of life that you've forgotten what's important? You are welcome to walk with Jesus. You always putting off what you know you need to do. You're welcome too. Jesus welcomes all of these people who come, and that is the beauty of journeying with Jesus. The church This community of people that are are walking this road with Jesus is made up of people just like this. When the church is what it's supposed to be, it is the most revolutionary community. It is the most radical place of acceptance that this world has ever seen. Because everyone, absolutely everyone, is welcome. The second thing that we learn from this is sort of the other side of that coin. Everybody is welcome, but in these encounters that Jesus has, we see everyone is also asked to change. Each of these people is welcome to join Jesus on the road to Jerusalem, but each person is asked to change as they walk on that road. They can't stay like they were before. You know, Jesus tells James and John, for example, hey, I see that you don't like these Samaritans. I see that you would like to have them dead. I get that, but that's not okay. If you want to stick with me, you've got to start living differently. Accepting that we all need to change is one of the most important parts, the most important steps that we can take as a community of faith. Sometimes we forget that this really is a journey that we are all on. It's not just a decision that we made one time and that was it. We really are on a lifelong lifelong journey of following Christ. And accepting that we have our weaknesses is one of the most important parts of that journey. There's a man named Jean Vanier who says it this way. To accept our weaknesses and those of others is the very opposite of being complacent. To accept our weaknesses is essentially a concern for the truth so that we don't live in some kind of illusion, but we grow from where we actually are. It's only when we know who we are and who others are with all our strength and all our weakness It's only then that we can build something together. So we're all welcome to follow Christ, but it's only when we recognize that need to change, we recognize those areas of sin and weakness in our lives, and we accept that, that we're always going to need to work on that sin. It's only then that we can be serious about growing individually and growing as a church. And the third, final lesson I would take from this 
The third thing we see in these encounters is that there is always cause for hope. When you think about the life of Jesus, he faced some very frustrating situations. There could have been some moments when he was tempted to give up. Always something he could have been discouraged by. In this story, he could have been very disappointed with the kind of people that he's attracting. He's trying to get people to follow him on this road, and everybody who's showing up and presenting themselves, they just don't seem to measure up. They're just not up to par. But you know what? Jesus keeps on going. He keeps on teaching. He keeps on calling people. He keeps on interacting with people. And I think that gives us one of our best reasons not to throw in the towel too. If Jesus didn't give up, why should we? If Jesus still had hope and trust in God that it would all work out on his journey, can't we still have hope on ours? And I, I really do hate to be too political, but again, that's the opposite of what we sort of see in our public life right now. If you listen to any politics at all, it seems like everyone is trying to convince us that we should be afraid, that we're all doomed and there is no hope. We should be afraid of what will happen if one candidate or the other is elected. We should be afraid of some certain group of people. They're the cause of all our problems. We should be afraid of this or we should be afraid of that. And it's not just our country either. In the UK, that referendum that they just had about whether they should stay or leave the European Union, a lot of that was all about fear too. The people who wanted to stay said that you should be afraid of what will happen if you leave and vice versa. A lot of people just want to convince us that we should be discouraged and be hopeless and be afraid. But again, Jesus shows us another way. Jesus is not discouraged by these little ups and downs of life. He sees that his life, his ministry, it's grounding in something so much deeper. It's grounded in the hope of God. God is the one who stands ahead of Jesus on the road. God's the one who's calling him. So there is not the slightest need to be afraid. On this road with Jesus, there is always, always, always hope. Every person is welcome to join us on this journey of faith with Christ. It doesn't matter who they are, what they're dealing with. Jesus welcomes us all to come. But each person is called to change, too. Live a more holy life as God intends. And because of these two things, we can always have hope. There's a poem from the 13th century that says it this way, and I just love it so much. It says, Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Come, even if you have broken your promise a thousand times. Ours is no journey of despair. Come yet again. Come. Will you join me in prayer? God, we give thanks for the journey that you are calling us each to walk. A life of discipleship with Christ each day. As we go through our lives, we don't have to walk aimlessly, but we can follow your Son. We pray that as we end our time of worship, you would show us what we need to do to follow you a little more closely on that journey. Maybe who we need to welcome, maybe who we need to change, how we need to change, whatever it might be. But that you would renew your hope within us so that we could follow you a little more closely. Amen. As we sing our final hymn,